I'm Julia Lupton, and I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of UCI's Mu chapter of Phi Beta Kappa, the nation's premier honor society. As president of the Mu chapter this year, 2020-2021, I have been so proud to meet many PBK members in the ranks of our faculty, staff, students, and alumni. And I'm glad to be part of the meticulous and considered process by which we are currently inviting new members into our ranks, culled from our most intellectually ambitious and imaginatively capacious juniors and seniors. In addition to GPA, we look at the academic and service activities that demonstrate excellence, commitment, versatility, and character. Tonight, we are thrilled to host our 2020-2021 Phi Beta Kappa guest speaker, Roger Gwenver Smith. Roger Smith was an American studies major at Occidental College, and his liberal arts training in history, literature, politics, and culture shaped him as an actor, writer, and director. Roger has made his mark in theater history as the creator of extraordinary one-man shows based on the lives of significant figures from history. I was absolutely riveted by Roger's performance in a Huey P. Newton story. This extraordinary rendition of the last hours of Huey P. Newton, a founder of the Black Panthers Party, began as a one-man show at New York's Public Theater. During that run, Roger won the Obie Award for his performance, which he created, wrote, and performed solo. Spike Lee then made it into a film in 2001, retaining the feeling of a stage performance. This is a mesmerizing work, part stand-up comedy, part riff on history, and part lonely cry of the anguished soul in the night. I cannot recommend it to you highly enough. Other major works by Roger Smith include his rendering of Rodney King, which received a Bessie Award. He has also created works based on the lives of Frederick Douglass, Christopher Columbus, and Bob Marley. His latest solo work is called Otto Frank, inspired by the life of the father of Anne Frank and he has also performed in many films and television shows. Roger Smith exemplifies the values of Phi Beta Kappa. Himself one of PBK's illustrious members, his career integrates history with art, research with new creation. He has been visiting classes at UCI all week, and we are so happy to be learning from him during this residency. I'm gonna turn it over now to Roger, and you may pose questions in the Q&A box dur during, and, during the performance and for our final question and answer period. So I wanna just have all of you join me in welcoming Roger Smith. My father said, son, I have uh, diabetes, hypertension, and cancer of the prostate. I'm a black man. I can't deny it. And now that I have been a black man, son, why don't you go ahead, try it. But do not forget your father's golden rule. Get yourself a trade. Go to some professional school. You get something that they cannot take away. You see, in Washington, D.C., we Negroes built the Capitol, but did we Negroes get the credit? For many a year, I ran an elevator there, and no, son, I do not regret it because I saw firsthand that power has its ups and downs. And my second hand was on the lever. And now, 
you want to call yourself an artiste. <laughs> you think you're so goddamn clever. You know, if Van Gogh was Negro, he would have cut off more than an ear. You hear? Charlie Parker, certified genius. They put him in an insane asylum, Charles Lingus. Brilliant pianist Bud Powell, he had to scrawl 88 keys on his nuthouse wall. And what's the boy's name? Hmm? The one you love to emulate from Brooklyn, starts with a B, Haitian, Puerto Rican, Basquiat, Jean-Michel, hell, that boy didn't live long enough to see his shit really sell. So you go ahead and be a painter, but You'll never paint your way out of this coffin called the U.S. of A. But believe me, son, when I tell you this, I love you. I love you anyway. And so does your mother. We love you. We love you just as much as we love your sister, the lawyer, and your doctor brother. And if you're going to be an artist, you be the best artist that you can possibly be. And before it's all over, son, why don't you Paint a painting of me. Anybody going up? Anybody going down? Anybody going up? Anybody going? It is civil war. It is civil war, 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 war. It is civil war. It is civil war. For 20 years and more, we've given our strength, our more and political influence to increase the power and ascendancy of slavery. And now this slave holding power comes with sword, gun and cannon to take the life of the nation and overthrow the great American government. Well, verily they have their reward. The power given to crush the black man now overwhelms the white man. The nation has put one end of the chain around the ankle of the slave and the other end around its own neck. They've been planting tyrants and are now getting a harvest of civil war and anarchy. The American people and the government at Washington may refuse to recognize it for a time. But the inexorable logic of events will force it upon them in the end that the civil war now being waged in this land is a war for and against slavery. And it can never be effectually put down till one or the other of these vital forces is completely destroyed. The irrepressible conflict long confined to words and votes is now to be carried by bayonets and bullets and may God defend the right. Ah. 
our hearts are enjoined tonight around this small table. There are eight of us. And that is infinity. But soon there will be only one of us. And that is a tragedy. A play is in a play. Wherein the players are here today and gone tomorrow and tomorrow and no tears, no sorrow. Quick note to self, there are many who have lost more and will continue to lose. And this is the lesson of this hour. Miss Billy Holiday's blues. The strange fruit. Getting stranger. I, uh, I can't breathe. I, I have my ID right here. I, I am, my name is Elijah McLean, and that's my house. I was just going home. I I'm an introvert. I'm I'm just different. I'm, I'm so sorry. I I have no gun. I don't I don't do that stuff. I I wouldn't even kill a fly. I I don't eat meat, but I don't judge people. I, I don't I don't judge people who who do eat meat. I'm I'm an introvert. I I just want to do better. I I swear I I will do it. I, I will do it. I'll do anything. I'll, I'll change my identity. I, I love you. Just, ow, you're hurting me. That hurts. Teamwork makes the dream work, right? I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't breathe.
for the moment. My son, Lewis H. Douglas, represents our whole people. Rising up from degradation to respectability and from proscription to equal rights. The principle involved is one for which every man and every woman ought to contest for it involves the right to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness and it is the business of every American citizen black and white. Lewis had just returned home from the war. He stood on the walls of Fort Wagner, borne himself like a man on the perilous edge of battle, and now that the war was nearly over, Lewis returned home, somewhat broken in health, but still willing, still able to work at his trade. But alas, he begged in vain of his fellow worms to give him leave to toil. Day after day and week after week and month after month, Lewis sought work, he found none. And he came home sad and dejected. You know, for 16 years, I had printed a public journal up in Rochester, New York. I had employed white men, white apprentices during all this time. I paid out to white men in Rochester at least, what, $100,000. And yet here was my son, a young man of good character who learned his trade in my office. Uh, Civil War veteran, and yet unable to find work in his trade because of his color and his race. You know, walking upon my fellow citizens out there in the street, I've never failed to receive my due courtesy and kindness. In fact, there are even some men out there who have shown an interest in saving my soul. But of what avail are such manifestations where one sees himself ostracized and degraded and denied the means of obtaining his daily bread. But it's not all about you. Right, Rodney? It's not all about you. Right, Rodney King? A lot of people talk about that girl. Right, Rodney? A lot of people talk about that girl. Right, Rodney? What a girl name. Huh? What a girl name, Rodney. It's an LA name. What a girl name. Latoya? No, that's not it. Latanya? No, that's not it. What a girl name, LA name. Latasha. That's it. Latasha. Harvard, 15 years old, walked in conveniently into a convenience store to get herself a dollar, 79 cents worth of orange juice, some cuckoo de naranja. She got $2 a day. But the lady behind the counter, she don't understand. She thought that Latasha was trying 
to shoplift on her. So the lady behind the counter, she slap her. <laughs> Latasha slap her back. Boom, boom. <laughs> you can see it on the security cam. Put the orange juice down on the counter. Turn her back to the lady behind the counter. Walk out the store. And the lady behind the counter. Miss Sun Jadu. This is what Miss Sun Jadu would do. She reach underneath the counter, pull out a gun, small caliber, and shot Latasha in the back of the head. Dead. Two dollars in a hand. Two. George Washington. And Ms. Soon Jadu was arrested. She was indicted for girl slaughter. She was tried in front of a jury of her peers, and the jury of her peers recommended the highest possible sentence, but uh, Presiding judge says, wait a minute, hold on, time out on the court. Five years probation. $500 fine. And 400 hours of community service. And the community is saying, wait up, hold up, time out on the court. What about the 400 years of community service that we have given this country? And this is the justice with which y'all going to serve us? Tasha Hollins was a good student. When she grew up, she said she wanted to be a lawyer. She was only 15 years old, but she didn't have no quinceanera. And Latasha's mama, when Latasha was just nine years old, she got popped in a ballroom brawl, y'all. So she's a second generation handgun victim. So it's not all about you. It's not all about you. You I would like to present you with this little checkered book, empty, fill it, Anna. Fill it with our dreams, 
to nightmares. And by all means, do try to live up to the meaning of your two given names. Grace. And. God is my thou. And now. Will I wish you. The happiest. Birthdays. My child. Lucky number 13. <laughs> you, you, you are a Gemini. Star-crossed and stubborn. And the apple of your father's eye. Even when he is blinded by a Teutonic rage, tempered by a bourgeois civility. You know, I, uh, I punched a man out in the camp. One of my closest comrades. nearly took his life. After the war, I wanted to apologize. Effect truce. Your comrade. My bad. <laughs> yes. That. Is your dad. Remember when we slathered the walls of your little room with those. Black and white photographs of movie stars that we ripped out of those magazines, and also, curiously, the photograph of a white man in black face, black Pete, the Christians call him, Zwart Piet, riding shotgun to St. Nick. We are German, not Dutch. And I am a decorated World War I veteran, German, not Dutch. We cross the border, but the border will never cross us. Even with this stateless status, even as we are herded into the future, unknown. If I, could I, would I, could I, would I, Pull you across the border. Mi amor. Mi amor. Against all odds, no matter the danger. La peligrosa. Replant your beloved chestnut tree now fallen in more arid climes. 
where fathers and daughters cross rivers and borders, fronteras. in love. June 10th, 2009, and another father has fallen. The Holocaust Museum, Washington, D.C. There is to be a play that night at the museum in celebration of what was to have been your 80th birthday. Anna. A play which imagined you in conversation with another murdered child, a boy, murdered the same summer that Disneyland opened in a place called Money, Mississippi. A white man, elderly, aged 88, double infinity, came to the museum that night. He was the uh, father and son. He entered the museum where he was greeted by another man, younger, black, also the father of a son, security guard, who said, welcome, shalom. And the elderly man produced a rifle and It was a scene straight out of the Bible. The security guard died very soon after arrival and the son of the murderer alleged said that the wrong man had died that day and the son of the victim, just, just a little boy. Microphones and television cameras stuck up in his face, said that he was sad and he was mad at the man who had shot and killed his dad. And the American flag, red, white, and blue, flew at half mast. And the museum placed a black plaque up on the wall in memory of the father where he had stood. You know, on the walls of all these museums, there are maps where we might trace the progress of our egress, our demise. But what of the rise of this new power still ascending? All these 
tiki torches on parade. There is one woman, and I know that you would be proud. She put on a hard hat and ascended a flagpole in Columbia, South Carolina to rip down the past. And when she came down, she was immediately coughed. As quietly she prayed to her God. As did the congregations in Charleston and Pittsburgh and Christchurch and Poway, where a woman, and I think that you would be proud. She stood and fell in the line of fire. Anna. Anna. Could I ever? Should I? Would I? Could I? Ever forgive those? Responsible for your mind. Like that great man in Oakland who went to prison, San Quentin, to embrace the man who had shot and killed his 16 year old daughter. You see him on TV, CNN, the killer. He looks like he's about to cry. Daddy? I hear you ask. Daddy? Yes, Anna. Daddy? What's a drive by? It's my darling. It's Just another way to die. And thank you, UCI, for your kind invitation to me and the many people I have Julia, thank, thank you for your wonderful introduction. Thank you, Roger, for that amazing. If you have Q's, maybe I have some A's. <laughs> yeah.
thank 20 you minutes. So, thank you so much for that extraordinary sharing of pieces of so much of your work and so much of history, um, so much suffering and so much love. I really am moved. Um, if people have questions for Roger, you can put them in the Q&A. And I'll just start um, just by asking about, about process and affect. I mean, um, how, how you put together the evening, but also how you compose these. Feel history moving through you like that. Um, I mean, you're like one of the prophets, <laughs> you know, feeling the force of history and being open and receptive to the to history in a way that must be kind of overpowering. How how do you handle it? <laughs> well, I've broken a bit of a sweat. Um, and I've shed a couple of tears. And that's real sweat. And those are real tears. And they come from this instrument that I play called the human heart, the human emotion, the human intellect, the human body. I wish that I were there to share all of that with you live and direct, but at present moment, I have to put it in an electronic box and push a button and send it to you. And uh, thank you for being receptive. Um, what you heard were a number of excerpts. Um, Kicking off with a piece called Iceland, a son talking about his father and playing his father, uh, somewhat inspired by my own late father. Um, but this man is an artist who has gone to uh, Iceland to paint volcanoes uh, and to negotiate the own volcanic turbulence of his, of his spirit having escaped literally an abortive relationship in Brooklyn. We heard, of course, from Frederick Douglass uh, in a couple of instances um, as the Civil War emerged in April 1861. And in listening to Douglass, I think that he has a lot to say, not only about 1861, but about our present moment particularly January 6th. And the father in Iceland, of course, talks about the capital and how the capital was built and by whom. And Douglas, I think, always reminds us um, in a political way and in a very personal one, because we heard Douglas talk about his son, who was a Civil War veteran, who returned from the war, having been a war hero, and unable to find work because of his race, even after his father had employed white men and white apprentices at his own personal printing business. We heard from Elijah McLean, uh, tragically, the final words of that young man uh, who lost his life at the hands of the Aurora Police Department in Colorado. And I think that when we listen to his final captured words, it gives us a sense of the life that was that was snuffed out on that fatal evening. Um, a young man who described himself as an introvert. who said that he was different. And he was actually wearing a mask that night. And this was, of course, pre-COVID. This was the year before. And 
that alerted people, I suppose, that he was suspect in, in some way. But he was injected with ketamine, which is used to tranquilize horses. And he weighed about 123 pounds. We heard a couple of times from Otto Frank, who was, of course, the only survivor of his immediate family, in the Holocaust. His wife and two daughters, including Anna, the great diarist, were murdered by the Nazis. Um, his negotiation of, of loss. Um, and then kind of mixed in with an imagined vision of, uh, of my friend, Donald Lacey, who went famously to San Quentin to embrace the man who had murdered his daughter. And this was captured on CNN. And the man is now free, he got parole. And how could Lacey have possibly found it within himself to, to embrace and forgive this man for doing the unforgivable. Um, Otto Frank also talks about this event at the Holocaust Museum in, in which a, a, a black man, a security guard, uh, is, is murdered by a white supremacist. Um, and obviously Otto Frank was not there, uh, although he did live a long life, but not that, that, not that long. He died in, I think, 1980. But um, this is where the historical imaginative process takes me, and hopefully you, you as well. You took and I think we on with you. got um, nine questions out there. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so Kyle Jones uh, uh, says, Mr. Smith, I appreciate you giving voice to Elijah Mc McLean. When things get back to normal, do you plan on staging this? Is this already a full length piece or is this a, tell us a little bit about the, your, the history and plans. Well, I, I really thank you for giving me this opportunity because, you know, it, it, it's unique. I've never done these pieces in confluence with with one another. Maybe they speak to each other, maybe they don't. Maybe there's an overriding theme here, maybe not. Maybe I I need a class <laughs> professor to tell me that. Uh, a fatherhood but, certainly seems to be one theme. <laughs> what, the father, yes. Fatherhood um, yes. is one theme. Absolutely. And again, that's what struck me as somehow connecting it to the prophets and to yeah you know, traditions of benediction as well as traditions of testifying. Yeah, yeah, there, there is all that. And uh, I went to Catholic school for nine years, so I know all about benediction because that's the end of the service and that means that you get to go really quickly thereafter. <laughs> uh, there are some very nice comments um, in yeah. the chat. And I appreciate your appreciation. Thank you so much for listening. I know that you had other Cinco de Mayo options this evening. And, and, and thank you for sharing uh, your Cinco de Mayo with, uh, with me. Can we, can we answer a couple more of these questions? Yes, of course, um, please. Jan Elbaum, who's one of our wonderful community members and has yeah. been, uh, just celebrated her 101st birthday, if I may comment. What? And, um, she has had a life in the theater and a life of teaching and being a, a, a just a wonderful person. Anyway, Jan says, how do you deal with the stress of such an emotional drain after an evening's performance like this? And I would guess I would add to that. My husband and I watched the Huey P. Newton story, um, and that is just such an expensive spirit. Uh, can you comment on the kind of stamina and as both an actor and a, an ensouled creature, what it's like to do, do this kind of performance? 
Well, thank you so much for your generous response and and for the generosity of your work and spirit. Um, you know, it's said that people who work in Reiki, in massage, in yoga, even who absorb negativity all the time, who process it and, and try to fix it, have to in some way after it's over, touch wood, uh, touch stone. Um, I'll probably watch the Dodgers game now and, and hope that they win. They're, they're doing horribly against the Cubs. Um, and, 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 and that's where I'll go. Um, but um, it, it, it is difficult, I think, playing this instrument called me. And uh, I, I know that I have to uh, have a consistent investment in me, but I don't try to make a fetish out of it. I don't meditate in, in, you know, in a dark room for half an hour before I do something. Uh, in fact, as you know, Julia, there was, there was kind of a electronic crisis, you know, getting into the Zoom land uh, 15 minutes before we started. So that was what was on my mind at, at that point. Well, it's better um, than L.A. traffic. <laughs> it's better than L.A. traffic. I didn't have to, you know, fight the 405 uh, tonight, but um, hopefully I will be on the 405 and, and coming down to you soon. Uh, here's a question from Dr. Rose Jones about the, the, our occasion tonight, which is Phi Beta Kappa. How has being a member of the Phi Beta Kappa Society impacted your career and art over the years? And maybe you could also talk a little bit about your relationship mm -hmm. to Occidental College and, and the Obama yeah. scholarship program that you're involved with mm -hmm. there. Well, I must say that this is my first involvement really with Phi Beta Kappa. Um, I was invited um, by Dr. Jonathan Holloway, uh, who is the distinguished new president of Rutgers University. And Jonathan had been very generous in, in hosting me at both Yale, uh, which is my uh, graduate school um, alma mater, and at Northwestern, uh, both institutions where he served uh, uh, with distinction. And um, he invited me to be a part of, of this um, process. Now, it was supposed to have originally been kind of a, a rock and roll tour of America, uh, hitting you know six or seven campuses throughout the course of this year, but that wasn't to be. And in fact, uh, we planned UCI at the end because we had thought Maybe by May, you know, we'll be back to normal, but we're not, unfortunately, because I thought, oh, that's easy. I'll just get on the freeway and we'll be able to pull it off. But, you know, we had to do it this way. But this has been a tremendous experience to, to, uh, to go from campus to campus. I've done about uh, a half dozen uh, schools. So I've, in a way, you know, done this national tour without getting on one plane. And, and there is an advantage to that, believe me. Uh, but to uh, to have this opportunity is, is has been an extraordinary one. And I think you had another question. What was yes, this is from Alan Sinius, who is one of our community friends. Hi, Al. <laughs> and he wants to know, is that a poster of Bobby Seale, the Black Panthers behind you? I had one uh, point of me of our daily story. No. That's, uh, that's Huey Newton, uh, who I played in a Huey P. Newton story. And that's only the only thing that's left of the, the poster that used to be in front of the Actors Game Theater many years ago in, in L.A., but uh, that, that's what remains. And then the other side of me is, uh, the other side of me is, uh, the other side of me, oh, there, there it is. It's a... Uh, um, it's a piece of fabric that was um, made in West Africa for the centennial of the birth of Marcus Garvey, who was the founder of the Universal Negro Improvement Association. 
And so that was created for that. And it's and if it looks like it's glowing, it's not really. It just has light. It's left with the light coming through it. So uh, that's what I'm surrounded by and a bunch of other stuff, too. I got There's an American flag here that I'm looking at and a picture of uh, uh, St. Martin de Porres, who's my patron saint. And so you surround yourself with history. I do. What's so interesting I about do. the project is the... The way in which you kind of bring history to life. That's my mom. Aww. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's Helen Gendry Smith. She was an amazing lady. Um, so wonderful. Well, and you wanted me to talk about Oxy. Yeah, I was uh, I was an American Studies major there, and uh, I am working with the uh, Obama Scholars uh, Program. Um, our uh, 44th president, let me get that number right, uh, was uh, at Oxy for a couple of years before he transferred to Columbia. So he has a good uh, relationship uh, with, with Oxy. And we have a program there uh, through which uh, students are encouraged to provide community service. And, uh, and that's basically what what's going on there. We have a great uh, new president at Oxy uh, as well, Harry Elam, who is a practitioner of theater and a scholar of theater. Uh, and I think that Harry is, is probably the only uh, theater uh, person who is running a liberal arts uh, institution in this country. And uh, good things have happened so far and lots more good things will happen. Well, that's wonderful. So we'll just ask one final question here and then we'll let you go catch up on the game. <laughs> um, this was from Ella Turan. She says, so powerful, Roger. Thank you. How, do you, how do you weave all these texts together? So they're once individual stories, but you're also trying to kind of present a cohesive narrative. How did you design tonight's experience? Well, tonight's experience was um, in many ways improvised because it was pulled from a variety of experiences that, you know, had been created through improvisation. Some pieces that were written, some obviously that were spoken by other people or written by other people. But when I stepped up to five o'clock, I had no idea in which order I was going to be presenting the work and how the pieces would or would not relate to each other. Uh, I believe in, you know, a, a, a certain uh, spiritual um, openness. And uh, Ella is uh, Haitian, and so she knows whereof I speak. Um, we have to let go and allow or um, allow the spirit to inhabit us. And, um, and that in, in a certain way is, is, is how this evening was, you know, was constructed. And I'm sure it'll be one of a kind. If there's another evening like this, it will not quite be like this. But know that Huey Newton came out of 600 some odd improvisations. Rodney King was improvised. Some of my work is written, but a lot of it is improvised. So. Oh, that is beautiful. We feel truly lucky, truly blessed to have been able to experience this with you. And um, I want to thank our audience. I, I see that I have students here, colleagues here. My husband is here. Um, uh, next year, our vice president of Phi Beta Kappa is here. He'll become president next year, Jonathan Fang, here of our Moo chapter. My friend right. Vivian. So I just want to thank everyone who, who came and contributed their attention. And I hope that you leave um, moved and renewed and strengthened by tonight's event. So th thank you so much, Roger. And I'll see you in our Shakespeare mm -hmm. class on Friday.